Hello, and welcome to the Read the Bible podcast from Imago Dei Church. This is episode three. I'm your host, Daniel Jansen, also known as DJ, along with my beautiful wife. Krista Jansen. <laughs> Do you want me to say your name for you? Is it, yeah, is it it's good? Yeah, it's kind of weird. Okay. Yeah. Along with you my beautiful wife, Krista <laughs> Jansen. How you doing, babe? Doing well. Thank you. Awesome. I've been thinking about like toying with different introductions as we're uh-huh. getting this podcast going. Like, hello, or something like that. I probably just caused the audio to, to peak when I said that. Yeah, or, I think so. Or I was thinking about bringing back. Do you remember the um, the Budweiser commercials that was, ah, uh, no? No. No, you can't even get you to laugh yeah. at all. Okay. No. All right. Well, we're here uh, to talk about the Bible. What we want to be doing is creating this resource um, for anyone that's a, doing the Bible reading with Imago Day. Uh, we've been taking a book of the Bible every single month and trying to study it at, at a deeper level, asking questions of the Bible because we're seeking to encounter God through his word and we want to honor it and to realize there's a whole treasure of um, the riches of God that we find in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Krista, like what happens when we study the Bible? Like what happens in our minds, in our hearts? Like why do we participate in this activity? Yeah, well, um, the biggest reason that we do this is because God has revealed himself through his word. And Romans tells us to renew our minds, Mm. um, that we need to be intentionally in the process of renewing our minds Um, And so when we encounter God through his word, that is a huge part of how that renewal happens. And God is able to shape us more and more into his image and into his likeness through his word. And so if you Mm want to know who God is, if you want to know who Jesus is, this is how you do it. It is through his word um, that we are formed and shaped and that we get to encounter him. I think about just how incredible that is what you just said. You just said it so matter-of-factly, but the idea of our minds can be renewed, and that yeah. that's the goal is that there's actually transformation that happens right. beginning in our mind, in mm-hmm. our hearts, in our lives, that we can be changed right. as we read the Bible because yeah. we're meeting with the living God. It's one of the the ways we can in, we can meet with God in, in different ways. We, we, we see God you know, when we're praying and we're in nature and all sorts of ways in which we can can participate in that, but God has given us his word and said, this is who I am. Mm-hmm. This is how you can know me. And like, there's an opportunity to dig into that and to sit and to rest in that. And so, wow, it's incredible. With that, every month we're putting out a new book, a new study guide uh, for the book of the Bible that we're going to be reading and journeying on. This podcast right here is to help us launch the month of March 2024 uh, for Imago Day as we are going to be reading through what book? We're going to be reading through the book of Mark. So March is the book of Mark. Awesome. And yeah, it's going to be great. Awesome. We're going to dive into that in just a second. Quick overview. Whenever we're reading the scriptures, we're looking to do three things. It's comprehension, interpretation, and application. Mm -hmm. Comprehension is when we're asking questions of the Bible. We're making observations. We're not just reading it quickly and like just, you know, uh, trying to just what stands out to me in terms of um, quick uh, like surface quick, level yeah. things, really taking the time to, to read something and say, oh, what does that word mean? And looking up in a dictionary what that word means or or asking the question, why did the, you know, God say that? Why mm-hmm. is that here? Or what's going to mm-hmm. happen next? Or what's the, the point that he's trying to make? We're, we're, we're asking different questions of things mm-hmm. that we're observing. And then from there, we're trying to interpret it. And we're saying, well, what does this mean? Mm-hmm. And I guess that would be the question of what's the point? What, right. what, why mm-hmm. was this written, right? So the first question is, is just trying to wrestle with what is this actually saying? Mm-hmm. And then we're asking the question, why was this said? What does this mean? And then that leads to application where we're really taking, trying to take that and press that into our lives to like, what, is it, what does this mean for my life and what I have to do with this information? Right, how is this shaping me? Exactly. Yeah. And so we're going to be doing that over and over again. And this month, again, with Mark. So Krista, lead us into this. Um, tell us a little bit about Mark. Like, this is going to be unique to us. It's new. It's a new l- style of literature. We were just in the book of Exodus. Now we're Mark. Mm-hmm. So it's Exodus had some stories and then also had law and, you know, What's Mark all about? What are we going to find as we 
open up Mark? Well, Mark is great because it is a uh, gospel. And so as you encounter Mark, you are going to very clearly encounter Jesus. Mm. Um, and so you, you, there is always Jesus. There are whispers of Jesus throughout the scriptures. The whole Bible is a book about Jesus, but specifically a gospel. It's just very, very blatantly in your face. Here is Jesus. You're going to meet him. So, yeah, gospels are kind of like biographies of Jesus, are they not? Exactly. Yeah. And so, Mark is one of the four gospels. Uh, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each gospel uh, gives the story of Jesus' life and ministry. And so, yeah, what, so we have four of these Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that right. give these stories of Jesus' life and ministry, like you said. Why do we need four? Right. And not just one. Right. So growing up, I was always confused, actually, as to why there were four Gospels, because it's like pretty much the same thing. So mm -hmm. just over and over again, kind of the same stories. Um, and that is somewhat true. But when you read the four Gospels, um, really what you want to do is you want to ask yourself, anytime you read a Gospel, what is this particular author trying to communicate about who Jesus is? Uh, what are they trying to show me? Uh, what's what's kind of their, their angle, if you will? And that's not because the Gospels are inconsistent. That does not make them... Uh, you know, contradict one another, but each person was different and how they interacted with Jesus and what they saw of Jesus is different. And so an analogy that I find helpful is um, some of you know, but we have five children. So if you were to ask each of our kids, hey, tell me something about your dad, uh, they would each tell you something probably a little bit different. Incredibly strong. Right, exactly. Handsome. Like dad is so strong. He's so handsome. He's very funny. Mm, um, tell me he, more. Yeah. Probably Chloe would tell you that you can't trust dad. Um, he's always playing tricks and pranks on you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, right? Like there's all these Fair things. Enough. The way that each of our kids experience and interact with their dad is different, but it doesn't mean that they have different dads or that dad is a different person. It's that they're giving a holistic picture of who dad is. And so that's the same thing with the gospels is that we're not just getting one story, one person's experience or eyewitness of Jesus, but we're getting four different accounts. And so we're getting four different lenses mm -hmm. to see the same Savior through. And so that that's a real gift that we have. Yeah. In fact, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what's called the synoptic gospels. That's because they share a lot of the same uh, content mm -hmm. within them. And that word synoptic is this idea of, um, it means to be seen together. And so there, the we see them. It's not oh, there's one picture. It's actually by putting these different pictures together. Yeah, they kind of coincide, to see, right? Uh, you know, yeah, exactly. More right. full picture. John's out there, kind of on an island. He's doing his own thing. John <laughs> is my favorite. Um, yeah, but if but. you ever read the Gospels, you'll notice Matthew, <laughs> Mark. And Luke have a lot of the same content. And right. John... He's um, just on his own. He's on he, an island. On his own. And yet, a lot of those same stories do come from the same places. Uh, what John gives you more... And this is about Mark, not John. But John gives you insight into some more specific conversations that I had. Brings right. you more into some of the personal life of some of those moments. That, right. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. But tell us more about Mark. That's what yes. we're here for. Yeah. So, what, so if there are a lot of even similarities, mm -hmm. um, what are some things that are are you know unique to Mark or kind of like maybe back into the historical context of why gospels were written and and um yeah what we're hoping to see in it um say the question again Deej. so do you yeah. want a historical context do you want to know what's in mark G like, give, what me the history, want? give me historical context i mean i know i was gonna share a little bit about this but <laughs> as you are, are on there what's what's some of the historical context that you can give us okay so we the gospels are the first books of the new testament and so this is where jesus finally comes on the scene and um if you go back we just did Exodus. If you were able to read Exodus with us, that's great. If you couldn't, that's fine. Um, but you get to Exodus where God delivers his chosen people, the Israelites, out of the hand of the Egyptians. And he is now leading them into a promised land. And so Old Testament, it opens with just you have the fall, you have creation, the fall, and there's a promise that one day there will come an uh, offspring of Eve who will crush the serpent's head, who will mm. defeat Satan forever. Come on. And then it hones in on this people group, the Israelites. These are the ones that God delivered out of slavery in Egypt mm -hmm. that we just read in Exodus. And so the whole Old Testament is the story of God's people. Mm -hmm. And it is this story of them coming into the promised land, establishing this nation. Uh, they are 
created and intended to live God's way, to participate in God's rule and reign and kingdom in the world, to show the world what God is like. Uh, but the whole Old Testament is just them messing up pretty much yeah. over and over again. Uh, they can't quite do it right. And so you get through the stories of the kings of Israel. And none of the kings are able to save the people of Israel. The sin is still there. Then you get to the prophets, the prophets of Israel that keep reminding God's people of his promises to come and save, to calling them to live in light of God's law and God's good way. Um, but again, they just they just can't quite get it right. And so you come to the end of the Old Testament where the people of Israel are in exile. They are dispersed. Mm -hmm. They are waiting for someone to come and save them. And they're just really hopeless. Uh, yeah. it's, does God remember them? Will he come and send a savior to rescue? Yeah. And then specific to, as we get into the gospels, as you have, thank you for that, that as you walk through the Bible and that overview of kind of the biblical history there, uh, what we find in history is also you have the Roman empire has come mm -hmm. at this point and is beginning to kind of dominate and take over the world. And so you have this people who have received these great promises from God of salvation, of hope, of future, of all right. these sorts of things. And they have turned aside uh, every way mm -hmm. and have now in exile, mm -hmm. like you said. And so they find, they find themselves as this marginalized people group uh, underneath the thumb of empire after empire after empire, each one seemingly stronger and greater than the right. next. And there's this hope um, that begins to just emerge more and more of what's called the Messiah, that mm -hmm. there'd be one who would come mm -hmm. and rescue and redeem uh, God's people um, from oppression, from slavery, from like like in Exodus, what we just read, which is why Exodus is such a powerful uh, story. Right. And Mark and these gospels are helping paint the picture and help us see that Jesus is that promised Messiah. He mm -hmm. is the one, Messiah meaning anointed king. Mm -hmm. He is the one who will come and redeem right. and save. Right. Only, plot twist, <laughs> uh, the way that Jesus saves is not quite the way uh, that, that, they expect. that they expect. And it's not just that he will save Israel, but that he will save the world. Come on, let's go. This is why it's the gospel. Mm, that's it's good news. All right. So uh, take us in and give us a little highlight reel. What are... Yep. We're going to be open up Mark. What are some things that we should be looking out for as mm -hmm. we are, you know, beginning this journey? You just highlight some themes for us, Krista. Sure. You've spent the time. You're the one that put the questions together for the study. You're the one that kind of outlined it. Mm -hmm. You've already been spending a lot of time in Mark. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What are some of the themes that we can expect to find? So some things that we can kind of have in our head right. as we're beginning that we can be looking for. Definitely. Yeah. So as you start this journey in the book of Mark, um, in any book of the Bible, but especially the Gospels, you're going to get a clue into what those key themes are in the first chapter. Um, the, the writers are pretty intentional to try to communicate right off the bat. Hey, here's where we're going. Here, Here's the angle we're taking here. here here's what we want to communicate. And so uh, first off in Mark 1, you see um, this huge theme of the whole book of Mark is really the authority of Jesus, that mm -hmm. Jesus's authority is something that you're going to notice come up over and over and over again. Absolutely. And so if you're or listening to this podcast, just look for that. <laughs> Almost yeah. in every chapter you read, you are going to see some form of his authority and his power being displayed. Well, just on that, why don't you, let's take the time yep. and let's dive into a passage. You want to show us a, a place or yeah. a couple places where we're going to see this unfold? I know I've got one in mind myself, knowing sure. that you're going to do that, but... Show yeah. us what's up. Yeah. So like I said, really, um, I want to use this kind of as an example as well of looking at that first book of the Bible uh, of this book. The first chapter is going to help unpack this theme. So if you look at Mark 1, it opens with John the Baptist, and it says that he is preparing the way of the Lord. And John is um, in the wilderness, and he is proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. So you have this guy in the wilderness, and he is preparing the way. And the way he's preparing the way is that he is um, helping 
the Israelites to understand that they have sin. They need repentance. They need forgiveness. And so everyone's coming to the to the river. They're getting baptized. They need forgiveness of sin. Um, but the tension there is, does the baptism actually forgive them? Like, how can they be forgiven? They can try to walk in repentance, but but who has the actual authority Mm -hmm. to forgive sin? And then right after that, you see Jesus comes on the scene. He is baptized. And as he comes out of the water, a voice comes from heaven and God proclaims, this is my son. So you have God putting this, this title, this favor, kind of like identifying Jesus as his son. And then Jesus is sent into the wilderness for he is tempted by sin, he overcomes sin. Mm -hmm. And then as he comes out of that, he begins his ministry. And here's the key thing I want to hone in on where we first see more clearly this theme of authority come up is immediately as he starts his ministry, he calls his disciples and they go to Capernaum. This is verse 21. And it was on the Sabbath and he enters the synagogue and he was teaching. And verse 22, it says, they were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And then there's in the synagogue, a man who had an unclean spirit and he's calling out at Jesus and kind of like um, threatening Jesus mm-hmm. or, you know, picking a fight, right? Sure. Yeah. And Jesus cast the demon out. And so, um, and he again shows his authority there. And so right off the bat, you see Jesus, Jesus is teaching. The people recognize, wow, he knows what he's talking about. He's speaking with some authority that we've never heard, never recognized. And then he actually demonstrates that authority by casting out an unclean spirit. And um, and then throughout Mark 1, you see more of his authority displayed. I'll let you discover that as you read Mark. Mm-hmm. Um, but but that right there, in just the first couple verses, the first 20 to 25 verses of Mark, you see, whoa, okay, we need forgiveness of sin. How is this going to happen? Here is the Son of God who actually has the authority and the power uh, to do something about it. Yeah, absolutely. I think you hit on... One of the just the key themes that you're going to find over and over again. Again, no. you're not trying to give everything away, but just I know look I want you to find things on your own. Authority, but. and especially in chapter one, it's something that's being established. Even just digging deeper into that passage, you highlighted uh, the idea of him teaching as one who had authority, not as a scribe. See, we find this in other parallels in in the Gospels. He's not just commenting on the scriptures. He right. is speaking with the power and referencing it in reference to himself. Mm-hmm. And then you have this moment. So he's he's assert, he's teaching with authority. They're observing this. They're saying, okay, well, there's this authority kind of around him. Mm-hmm. It's a kind of a question mark, right? Yeah. And then that authority is challenged by this demon who cries out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Mm-hmm. And especially in that time, but there's this idea of, uh, the na- a name and knowing someone's name is gives you power over them. That you, you, when, you're, when you're talking about de- demonic or uh, magic, again, especially in that culture, there's this idea of by knowing your name, I I have some sort of authority over you. And the demon's sort of challenging Jesus, saying, "I know who you are, the Holy One of God." And and there's this kind of crisis moment of Jesus is teaching as one who has authority, and now there's this challenger who comes on the scene and what's going to happen. And Jesus says, be silent and come out of him speaks and the unclean spirit convulsing and crying out with a loud voice came out and they were all amazed. So Jesus has this crisis and then the um, climax is Jesus, boom, casts him out. And the resolution is that the people now say, what is this? A new teaching with With authority. authority. Mm -hmm. And at once, his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region. So you have this like kind of mini scene of this like moment of like, is he, does he have authority? He wins the battle, so to speak. The authority is confirmed. And from there, all of a sudden fame spreads and you see that authority everywhere you go. Right. And again, just look out for that. We won't give it up all the way. So that's kind of one of the big ones. Yeah. What what else do we find? What's in the... uh, what other themes can yeah. we see? So another big theme that you're going to notice in the book of Mark is um, people's responses to Jesus. So you see his authority uh, throughout his ministry and as you read, and then you're also going to see how everybody responds to that authority. What do they do with Jesus? Who do they think he is? How do they, they're kind of, you could tell people are kind of mentally trying to process like who is this guy? Like, you know, like one of my, they don't really know what to do with him. And, um, and then 
again, at, when you're reading a book of the Bible, uh, sorry to always do this, but you you know, the first chapter is going to be helpful, but so is the last chapter. The last chapter is really key. And so to kind of illustrate this point, I want to go to the last chapter of Mark, which is Mark 16, um, because this is the author's, the writer's last chance to kind of like, hey, you know, what are we doing here? Let me hit you with this, what I'm trying to communicate. So in Mark 16, we have the glorious resurrection of Jesus. And you have Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome. They go to the tomb and they encounter an angelic being. They encounter the the angel at the tomb. Jesus isn't there. And he tells them, Hey, he's risen from the dead. And then after that, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene specifically, and and she gets to see the resurrected Lord. And so after this, Mary goes um, and she goes and tells all the followers of Jesus, hey, Jesus is resurrected. He's come back to life. And it says they did not believe her. They they would not believe it. There's no belief in them. And then after that, Jesus appears to two of his disciples on the road. They go and tell the other disciples, hey, we saw Jesus. And it says they wouldn't believe them. Uh, They couldn't believe what they heard. And so then finally, after that, Jesus appears to the 11 disciples remaining and he rebukes them Mm -hmm. for their unbelief. And um, he's like, now pretty much do you believe? Like you can see me. And um, it says in Mark 16, here at the end, in verse 15, he says to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And so really you see this throughout Mark, but what Mark is trying to leave you with here at the end is, how are you going to respond to Jesus? Mm-hmm. Are you going to believe um, in this Messiah? Are you going to believe that he has really resurrected from the dead, that he has really brought God's kingdom to earth? Are you going to put your faith in him? Um, and so that you could kind of see that in the last chapter. Again, it is throughout the whole book. So as you guys read on your own, I want you to take note of how different people are responding mm-hmm. to Jesus. Do they believe? Do they not believe? Uh, do they like him? Do they not like him? Like him, um, mm-hmm. you know, like where is kind of his, what is it? The popularity chart, you yeah, know, exactly. uh, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. but um, that that's a gauge throughout the book of Mark. And so you just see all kinds of different responses to who Jesus is in this book. Yeah. And that's incredibly important. I think Mark is written for a purpose, right? And mm-hmm. the purpose is not just to tell you about Jesus, right. but to introduce you to Jesus so that you, you can would, be saved. You can be saved. It's and, not just for our intellect. It's for our, our salvation, yeah. for our hearts. And you can really see this trace throughout. This is one of the really neat factors of the Gospel of Mark. It's one of my kind of favorite things about it. And in the very first verse, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, mm-hmm. right? I give them that title, Jesus right. Christ, Jesus Messiah, the Son of God. And then you have this phrase you'll notice over and over again. It's kind of funny, this word immediately. Look, as you're studying the Bible, studying Mark, look for the word immediately and it will pop up everywhere. Right. Mark is like going so fast, Mm -hmm. burns through like so much of Jesus's life and ministry out the gate. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it's immediately this, immediately this is a ton of action, 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 action. And then you get to Mark chapter eight, uh, where uh, Jesus asks Peter this question, who do you say that I am? And Jesus makes this confession of faith. You are the Christ, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like from that moment with that confession of this is who I see you to be. This is who I believe you are. Everything slows down. The first seven and a half chapters uh, of Mark are the entirety of the three years of Jesus's ministry. And then from Mark 8 to the end, it slows down and focuses in on his road to Jerusalem and the last week of his life once he gets to Jerusalem. So the first eight is like three years. And then the, the last eight chapters is like a week and some change, right. right? You know, in terms of, in terms of time spent, he's really zooming in the lens and that word immediately drops mm-hmm. and it focuses in specifically on his cross mm-hmm. and his suffering and the, the death of Christ. And you have this moment, I want you to just think about how radical this is in Mark 15 at the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, you know, and and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he uttered a loud cry, breathed his last. Verse 38, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him, that's a Roman soldier, uh, saw that in this way, he breathed his last. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? This loud cry, 
he says this, truly this man was the son of God. Mm -hmm. So the very first verse is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Mm -hmm. It follows on this quick bump, 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 bump. We're just trying to show you his authority, his authority, mm -hmm. his authority. Mm -hmm. And then it zooms in the lens and takes that authority and brings it to this place of crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And a Roman centurion looks up on the cross and says, think about that. This man, he's the one putting him to death. And mm -hmm. says, no, this man was the, the son, son of God. God. And there's this confession of faith. And Mark is showing us that to kind of help us say, yeah. what is your confession right. of who Jesus is? Right. Um, good. Oof, so hopefully people will, will meet Jesus. Yeah, babe? I hope so. <laughs> you know? I mean, if yeah, if you read, that's the most beautiful thing about God's word is you hear story after story of people throughout the world and throughout history mm -hmm. who just read God's word and come to know Jesus. Like, yeah. I mean, we were called to tell the gospel, but God is alive and active in his word. And so um, I'm excited. I'm hopeful for yeah. our church well, as we read it, through this. Even as you're saying that, babe, what is it that you love about this <laughs> book of the Bible? Yeah. So what I love about this book, kind of what we said, but I love the authority of Jesus. I mm -hmm. love that there is no sin. There's no darkness. There is no sickness that is outside of his power to heal, to forgive, to bring his light and his life. And when you read the book of Mark, it's just like, um, it's like, I don't know if this is cheesy. It feels like Jesus superhero almost. Mm -hmm. Like he's just like pow, pow, pow. Like that there is, um, there is no questioning what Christ can do. Yeah. And he is literally bringing God's kingdom into the world. And so I just love it. I just feel like I read it and I'm like, there he goes again. Like, mm -hmm. there he goes again. Yeah. Like, and it just, it lifts my heart. You, you, you get the, the least out of all the gospels, Mark is the shortest one. Yeah. And you get the least amount of Jesus's teaching mm -hmm. in Mark. You get extended sermons in Matthew and you mm -hmm. get his parables in Luke and John, which you get his conversations with conversations, people. Yeah. But in Mark, it's all action, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it, and there is some teaching, but it's largely this action. It's his authority. It's his power. And, and with that, his fame spreading and you see this movement that is right. kind of unlocked right. as just the kingdom of God is on the scene. It's on the move. And he, mm -hmm. he's bringing people in. So I'm always excited about that. Yeah. Uh, as, as we see that. Okay. Chris, it's drawing us kind of to an end. Mm -hmm. um, what are just some fun facts about about Mark, what were some fun facts about the Gospel of Mark? Something that that might surprise people. Uh, something mm -hmm. that is kind of interesting. Yeah. So uh, the one fun fact is that Mark was not an eyewitness of Jesus, uh, but Mark was actually John Mark, who was an assistant of the Apostle Peter. And so the Book of Mark is actually Peter's Gospel. This is Peter's retelling of his life with Jesus. And you'll notice that as you read, it's very vivid in the accounts that Peter has personally with Christ. So you, Peter is one of the three that's um, called onto the mountain when Jesus transfigures. It has Peter's confession as Jesus of Jesus as the Christ. It has Peter's denial. And um, you really get an inside glimpse of, of Peter's perspective. And I also loved, you said this earlier a little bit, DJ, but you really get the sense of Peter is kind of like, you really see the crowds in Mark. Like Jesus is a celebrity, mm -hmm. you know, really. It's people are just like, what do we do with this guy? And his fame is spreading like a wildfire. And you can almost imagine Peter as one of his disciples. And he's just like, what is like, Kind of like the excitement of like, I don't know what's happening, but I'm here for it. Yeah. And, you know, like it's just he's caught up in this this wildfire uh, of God's kingdom breaking through. And they don't really fully understand until after the resurrection. But, but I think that's a fun fact. So as you read Mark, just think of Peter, because this is really his stories that he told to his assistant, Mark. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that most Christians actually aren't aware of. That mm -hmm. This is Peter's gospel, right. uh, his recollection, his his kind of version of events and Mark is transcribing that. They were like, who is this Mark guy? Right. <laughs> There's a little bit of a fun fact. I don't want to say it's debated because um, it's just not known, but a lot of people kind of assume or wonder if Mark doesn't add himself into the story. Oh, yes. At some I know point. that. I was wondering if you would bring that up. Yeah, it's one of my favorite parts I'm I sure. learned about this because it's there's one bar, bit of Mark. So Mark is the first gospel that was written that we have. And uh, a lot of people believe that Matthew and Luke kind of used Mark as a template and then 
at, you know, made sure that they included their the teachings and things off of that. But there's one part of Mark that is like random, random and unique to Mark. You won't find it in Matthew. You mm -hmm. won't find it in Luke. You won't find it in John. And it is in chapter 14. That's right. And it's uh, chapter 14. I'm going to go uh, verse 49. So Jesus is about to be arrested. It says, day after day, I was with you and you did not seize me. And so they seize him. And it says, and they all left him and fled. And then verse 51, it says, and a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. <laughs> and a lot of people believe that that is actually, that's Mark adding his kind of like- Kind of like his cameo. His, you ca know? his cameo onto the gospel of like, who else would have known that? Like Peter's not there. Like, mm -hmm. how is this even included? And Mark is like, well, I got, I was there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I got something to add. Like right. I ran away naked. <laughs> so I just love that scene of like this dude, like, ah, I don't really have many memories. This is all Peter, but- I was there. I for was part. there for this. Yeah. Yep. And just what's that like, dude? Just mm -hmm. running around naked and yep. I mean if you're scared, you run. Hey man. Clothes or no clothes, <laughs> you run. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited for people to dive into Mark. I know for me in my own personal journey, it was I was probably seventeen and uh, reading through the gospel of Mark. And it was some of the things that you were describing, Krista, that gripped my heart and helped me just fall in love mm -hmm. with the person of Jesus and I met God through reading the gospel mm -hmm. of Mark. And so I'm, I'm praying that many people have that same encounter as right. well. Let me ask you this. Uh, what are some recommended resources? Give, give me one or two that you would sure. throw out to people if they're wanting to study a little deeper. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so this is actually just a general recommended resource. It's not mm -hmm. very specific to the book of Mark, but as we are pursuing diving deeper into the scriptures this year, I would recommend that if you do not have a study Bible, that you get one. Study Bibles are really helpful because they have all kinds of fun footnotes and facts at the beginning of the book, at the bottom of the page as you're reading. It helps to find words. It helps to give some historical context that you might not be aware of, of each particular maybe story or part of a letter. And so that's just a general recommended resource yeah. as you want to grow in studying the Bible a little bit deeper. A study Bible is a really good tool to have. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And most translations have a, like a proper study Bible yeah. to go with that translation that's reputable. We, you and I are using the ESV. The ESV study Bible mm -hmm. is top notch and I really recommend that. You've also been using this uh, journal if you want to show that to the yes, camera. Yes, I did show this a little bit last time, but every month or every time just in general that I read a new book of the Bible, I love to get the illustrated uh, journals, the ESV journals. They're on Amazon. So I order them and I get them the next day. And then they have the whole entire page right next to it where you can just jot down your notes. You can mark it up. And that's really helpful when you're studying the Bible is to have a copy of what you're reading that you can just make look ugly. Mm -hmm. Just ask your questions and underline and highlight and circle things. Um, and so I recommend... I always recommend people getting these, grabbing these, if you want to study a little bit further. Yeah. Lastly, I would recommend, mm -hmm. uh, if you ever want to do some commentary research and you're just kind of getting into something, commentaries are people writing about the passage of scripture and offering insights and backgrounds and things like that. Good place to start. There's a series called The Bible Speaks Today. So if you were to again, Google Bible Speaks Today, Gospel of Mark, Bible Speaks Today, Exodus, Bible Speaks Today, whatever book, you'll find that um, version or that book you know, uh, in that edition, super not complicated reading, but a pretty good deep dive. Mm. And then there's another series called the for you series. And, um, if you, if you were to look like the gospel of Mark for you series, you, you could find the resources that are there. And then specifically to the gospel of Mark, Tim Keller wrote a book called Jesus, the King. It's actually not one of his more famous books, but there's, um, just some incredible stuff in there and they're more like devotions or chapters on, reflecting on themes mm -hmm. within Mark. So that's not going to be as much of a deep dive into the the, the text of scripture in Mark, but it's going to be um, reflections on some of the themes that you find in Mark and expositing some individual passages. Yeah. It's, just, it's a great book. Awesome. All right, Krista. Well, hey, um, I said to you this morning when we knew we were going to film this, I said and record this, what are the odds that I say anything, just you and I today, like say anything inappropriate or, uh, you know, take this beyond rated g and uh and i said hi yeah hi yeah. and i feel like you know this is g i love Perfect. you you know i think of the fact that opposite ends of the table coffee cups 
very uh but i do love you <laughs> i know and um <laughs> maybe we can go on a date sometime all right thank you for tuning in and uh listening and excited to start this next uh month and reading in the gospel of mark until next time grace and peace